Welcome to week number three of Understanding the End Time. Uh, tonight's lesson is entitled Mid-East Peace Prelude to Armageddon. So the first two weeks, we took a look at modern nations in the Bible. Last week, we took, at, uh, took a look at the New World Order is One World Government. And again, tonight, we're taking a look at Mid-East Peace. Peace is an interesting word. Here, you'll understand that as we go through tonight's lesson. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of a lengthy scripture here, so please follow along. If it doesn't make any sense to you, that is okay. Um, I will tell you that Bible scholars do not understand the full interpretation of this, but you will see again why it is important as we move through this evening. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whoso readeth let him understand then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes so obviously this is a very um, important set of scripture for people to understand because the outcome of this scripture is that no one should go back to where they were when this event actually occurs. And it goes on to say this, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. I'm going to jump to an article from APnews.com in January of 2010. It said this, Israel's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu at the time, who actually is the prime minister of Israel again today after having other prime ministers in between his stint as prime minister in 2010. Israel's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, declared on Sunday that his country would retain parts of the West Bank forever, a statement sure to provoke Palestinians and complicate the year-old peace mission of a visiting U.S. envoy. Netan Netanyahu's words were clear. Our message is clear. We are planting here. We will stay here. We will build here. This place will be an inseparable part of the state of Israel for eternity. Why is this important? Judea, which the scripture speaks of in Matthew 24, is part of what is called the modern day West Bank. It is just that no one calls it Judea today. They call it the West Bank. But most scholars agree that the nation of Jordan called it this following Israel's 1948 War of Independence. Moving on about 19 years to what was called the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel took control of this West Bank from Jordan or Judea. Today, in the year 2023, this piece of territory is considered Ill illegally occupied under international law by the nation of Israel. What did our scripture just say regarding the West Bank or Judea in the book of Matthew? I'm reading again from Matthew 24, 16 to 18. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. So there are events that will lead up to what is known as the Battle of Armageddon. The Bible specifically prophesies a final seven-year period, which will immediately precede the last war before the end of this age. I did not say the end of time, Meaning when we talk about end time, we're not talking about the end of time. We're talking about the end of an age. That last war 
is known as Armageddon. During this seven year period, more prophetic fulfillment will take place than at any other time in the history of the world. A new Jewish temple will be in existence in Jerusalem and animal sacrifices will be performed. A world government will take control on earth and a powerful charismatic politician, a man of peaceful promises, I didn't say he actually is a man of peace, I said he is a man of peaceful promises, will become a world dictator. During the last three and a half years of this seven year time period, the worst religious and political persecution of all time will begin. And Jesus calls this period of time, the great tribulation. This tribulation culminates when the armies of the world come together against Jerusalem at the battle of Armageddon. Daniel had a prophecy, and we took a look at this. It's in Daniel 9, 27. Um, we talked about this last week a little bit and the week before, and it says this. It says, and he, lowercase h there, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst or in the middle of the week, he, again, it's a lowercase he there, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So let me read that for you in the Amplified Bible for a second. It says, and he, lowercase he, shall enter into a strong and firm covenant with the many for one week, or seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and offerings to cease for the remaining three and one half years. And upon the wing or pinnacle of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the full determined end is poured out on the desolator. And we will break that down. I understand what I just read is probably foreign to many of you. We will break that down. So there are five questions from these sets of scriptures that have to be answered if we're to comprehend the prophecy of Daniel 9, 27. Number one, what is the abomination of desolation? Number two, and I kind of already told you this, how long is one week? Number three, to what covenant does this scripture refer? Number four, what is the confirming of this covenant? And number five, who is he, lowercase h, that confirms the covenant? So the first item we're going to look at, what is the abomination of desolation that the scripture talks about? This abomination of desolation literally means, I'm not saying it's going to make your life simpler to understand, the abomination of the desolator, the abomination of the desolate one, or the one, which is actually probably the best description, the one who makes things desolate. In addition to the prophecy in the book of Daniel that we just read, Jesus also speaks about this same event. And let's go back into Matthew 24. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. So Jesus tells us something. Jesus says that when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, then you need to flee. Why? For then will be great tribulation, such as is not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The great tribulation that scripture talks about will be three and a half years, a three and a half year period of the greatest political and religious persecution in the history of the world that Jesus said would be triggered by something. Something would kick this three and a half year persecution off. What is that thing that kicks off this three and a half year persecution? 
It is this event known as the abomination of desolation. And then the great tribulation continues until the battle of Armageddon. So if Daniel wasn't enough and Jesus wasn't enough for you, the apostle Paul also speaks of this event in 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren. What does the word be beseech mean? Now we beg you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So Paul is actually speaking about the same event here. He said that the day would actually not come, except first there come a falling away. This falling away spoken of by the Apostle Paul has already occurred. When did it occur? Within a few years of the Apostle's last, the last Apostle's death, apostasy had begun then to start setting into the church and it began to decline one scriptural doctrine after another following the last apostle's death began to be changed until the church descended into what we know as the dark ages from about 500 a.d to 1500 a.d again this is not just church speak you can you can read this in your history books the average person did not even have a bible during this time period during this time period also, the church would become corrupted with much error and falsehood. Thankfully, the church began its climb back toward the truth out of the dark ages with the start of the Protestant Reformation. Paul states that after the falling away, that the, that the man of sin, who was also called the son of perdition, also called the beast or the antichrist, would be revealed. Paul goes on to tell us what this Antichrist will do. 2 Thessalonians 2 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. Daniel, Jesus, and Paul are all talking about the same exact event here. And it takes place in a restored Jewish temple in Jerusalem, halfway through the final week or the final seven year period. So the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist seizes the temple that is rebuilt. So obviously, you know, this cannot actually happen yet because there is no rebuilt temple again, but it's when he seizes this temple and declares himself to be Messiah. This is the blasphemous event that kicks off the Great Tribulation. And in a few weeks, we're going to talk much more about the Antichrist and the false prophet, and you will get characteristics of both of them uh, to give you a better understanding of how this person rises before ultimately this event known as the Abomination of Desolation takes place. But let's go back to Daniel's 70 weeks that he talks about. In order for us to understand what is meant by one week, we have to take a look at the set of scripture that is referred to as Daniel's 70 weeks. This is called, and I'm not telling you I could tell you a date, and I would never pretend to tell you a date. This is called the backbone of Bible prophecy, because it is the one prophecy that actually seals up all other prophecies from a time frame perspective. It is the greatest of all prophetic riddles because no one has definitively unlocked its mysteries. It is a precise time clock by which God will bring about the culmination of all things. And it says this, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. For what? to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy. 
and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So what is that right there? I'm going to stop for a second. That is 69 weeks. Let me go on. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Praise God. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he, lowercase he, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So towards the end of that scripture, it talks about that final week, which then comprises what is known as Daniel's 70 weeks. Let's break down these 70 weeks. 70 weeks in total are to be determined upon Daniel's people, who were Daniel's people, the Jews, and the holy city. What is the holy city? Jerusalem. The entire prophecy deals with 70 weeks. The first 69 weeks have already been fulfilled. The 70 weeks began when the command came for the Jews to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. This is a decree that is issued to Nehemiah in 445 BC. The 69th week would have ended when the Messiah would be cut off. What are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus' crucifixion. If this thinking is correct, then the first 69 weeks were to be 69 groups of seven years, which would total 483 years. But the 70th week has yet to be fulfilled. Why is that? We'll get there in a second. We have previously shown that the Great Tribulation period spoken of by Jesus occupies the last half of Daniel's 70th week. Daniel 7, 25, again, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints or the holy ones of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. How long is the 70th week? Just in case you're wondering if it's just as long as the rest of the weeks that Daniel talks about. The scripture gives a description of the time of the great tribulation under the rule of the Antichrist. It says, time times the dividing of time. A time is one year. Times is two years. And the dividing of time is a half a year, a total of three and a half years. How do we know this to be true other than you think that I'm really smart and I have red hair? We have other scriptures that explain it and confirm it. Revelation 13, 5. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. The Antichrist will make war with the saints for 42 months, or three and a half years. Revelation 12, 6 confirms the time period of the Great Tribulation in a different way. Revelation 12, 6 says, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Three different descriptions of time concerning the length of the great tribulation, three and a half years is what they all equal. So if the tribulation is three and a half years long and it occupies the last half of Daniel's 70th week, then the first half of the week would also be three and a half years long. Thus, a total of seven years. Just want to put it into your head. 
case you didn't pick up on it. Some people will tell you the Great Tribulation is seven years long. That is not true. It is three and a half years long. Bible prophecy seems to indicate that during the first three and a half year time period, the Antichrist will come to power through peace and diplomacy. He will be seen as the world's last hope for peace. During the second three and a half year time period, he will rule as a vicious dictator, causing horrible destruction and devastation, the worst the world has ever seen up to that point or will ever see again. What happens to bring this about? Why does this Antichrist change from a man of peace and diplomacy to a vicious dictator? Daniel 12.1. Scripture tells us that immediately prior to the Great Tribulation, a great war takes place in heaven. And it says this, And at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone shall be found written in the book. After Michael stands up, the time of trouble begins. Revelation 12, 7 and 11. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. What triggers this war in heaven? When this war takes place, Satan, it tells us, falls to earth in a terrible rage. Why? Because he knows his time is short. Satan has known from the beginning that he had about 6,000 years to deceive the world before, usher, before the ushering in of the kingdom of God. Satan also knows that unless he successfully overthrows the throne of God, he will be tormented for eternity. Satan did not know the full plan of God. He had no knowledge of the plan of divine redemption. Satan knew that Jesus, though, had to come to earth 2,000 years ago, but he didn't know why. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He did not understand the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But now he does. He knows today there are only a few short years from the time when he will be bound in a bottomless pit for a thousand years. And it is this knowledge that drives him to finally make one more futile attack against the armies of heaven. However, Michael and his army will fight against Satan, and Satan will be defeated. It's then that Satan will be cast out of heaven. He will not have access back and forth anymore, and he will be confined finally to this earth. Revelation 12, 2, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. This is not a human war. This is a spiritual war. Knowing that he's been defeated, Satan obviously will be extremely angry. And he will know at this point that he only has three and a half years left to do his work. He will attempt to accomplish on earth what he could not accomplish in heaven. He will start the great tribulation. 
until this time, the Antichrist, who is a real person, has been ascending to power by peace and diplomacy. But when the abomination of desolation occurs, the Antichrist undergoes a nature change and begins to rule with an iron fist. Could it be that Satan will possess the Antichrist and set himself up as the true Messiah? In reality, the Great Tribulation is not the wrath of God. It is the wrath of Satan poured out upon the earth. There is the wrath of God that immediately follows thereafter. We read about it in Matthew 24, 29. It says this, immediately after or directly accompanying the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That is the wrath of God being poured out upon the earth for those who have rejected him. But let's talk about on the wings of eagles for a second. Revelation 12, 13, and 14. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. God tells us that at the time of this great tribulation, the woman, who is Israel, will be given two wings of an eagle to fly to a place of refuge where she will be protected for three and a half years. Meaning where, where does she fly to? I could not tell you what the interpretation of that is. But we did learn in lesson number one that the eagle is the symbol of the United States. When the four beasts of Daniel 7 that we talked about over the last two weeks merge into the one beast of Revelation 13, the eagle's wings are no longer present. Why? Where are these eagle's wings? Let me give you three possibilities. One, it could be that the U.S. is included under the symbol of the lion since the wings were originally attached to the lion. This seems potentially possible, unfortunately, since there have been American presidents who have been proponents of a new world order. Second possibility is that the U.S. may not exist any longer as a world-dominating power. I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying a possibility. The third possibility is that the U.S. will not continue its present course to be absorbed into the one world system, and that it will resist the efforts of the Antichrist. But some government or some governmental power will be the wings of this great eagle that prevents the dragon's destruction of the woman. Perhaps God willing, there are those in America who do not want to surrender sovereignty to a world system, and hopefully those people will gain the upper hand. This could clearly happen since it appears from scripture that Europe, Russia, and China will be the dominant forces in, in the end time system. It is not a coincidence that Israel's staunchest ally is the United States. We support Israel financially with over $3 billion a year since 1949. Opponents of Israel argue that Israel has a population less than Hong Kong yet it's the re largest recipient of U.S. aid. The U.N. opposes our financial support of Israel. Most of Europe, Africa, and Asia also oppose our support of Israel. If the U.S. stopped supporting Israel, Israel would probably be in a lot of trouble. But let's move on, and we'll come back to that. One of the questions that we have to answer from our scripture in Daniel 9.27 is what does the covenant that this scripture talks about refer to? Daniel 9, 27 says this again. It says, and he, lowercase he, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The Bible prophesies also there will be a covenant that will be confirmed seven, at least seven years before the battle of Armageddon. This covenant must pertain to the status of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple, 
and the resumption of animal sacrifices. We know this. Why? Because when the covenant is broken, the temple will be desecrated and the sacrifice and the oblation that the scripture talks about will be made to cease or to stop. In case you weren't aware and in case you don't pay attention to anything in history, there is a big problem with Jerusalem. It is a huge problem and it will continue to be a huge problem until Messiah comes back to establish his earthly kingdom. On May 22nd, 1992, a document known as the Jerusalem Covenant was drafted and presented to the Jewish people. This covenant declared that United Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the state of Israel and that Jerusalem must never be surrendered or divided. The Palestinian people have vowed that there could be no genuine peace in the Middle East as long as Israel insists on retaining absolute sovereignty over all Jerusalem. I'm going to stop for one second. I think somebody's not muted. So if you could mute yourself, that would be great. I think it might be Sister Lori, but that could just be me staring at the screen quickly to take a look at that. In March of 1994, the United Nations class, this is the United Nations classified East Jerusalem as occupied territory, meaning that it was Palestinian territory illegally occupied by Israel. The U.S. abstained from that resolution. Although Israel claims United Jerusalem as her capital, the U.N. will not recognize the city as such and will not put foreign embassies there. Even the U.S. for many, 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 many years has refused to do so. U.N. Resolutions 242 and 338 call for Israel to withdraw from occupied lands in exchange for peace. Just so you're aware, and I'm going to give you a modern number in a second. Since its founding, approximately 50% of all UN resolutions have dealt in one way or another with the nation of Israel. You know how big Israel is? It's about the size of my desk I'm sitting at right now compared to the rest of the world. These resolutions are almost never in Israel's favor. In the year 2022, there were 15 resolutions condemning Israel. There was only 13 altogether condemning other nations of the world. 15 just against Israel, 13 for the entire rest of the world. Although many of the problems between the Jews and Arabs appear to be solvable, a lasting final agreement on the Jerusalem problem has always looked like it was one that could never be solved. According to the prophecies of Zechariah 12 and 14, the Battle of Armageddon, the war that triggers the defense of Israel by Jesus himself will be fought over the control of Jerusalem. Zechariah 12 says this, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Zechariah tells us this in Zechariah 14, behold, the day of the Lord cometh and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. God knows this is going to happen. This isn't going to come as a shock to him. And the city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue or the remaining part of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So there is some kind of covenant that will be in place that will then be broken before the great tribulation starts. But what is the confirming of the covenant that scripture talks about? I'm going to give you one possibility, just so let's bring it to modern times for a second. Under the presidency of Donald Trump, I'm not, this is not a political discussion here, even though the end time is all about politics and religion. 
there was something that was put into place um, between Israel and the United Arab Emirates called the Abraham Accords. And so there, are, there have been covenants made between Israel and other players in the Middle East for us to pay very close attention to. I'm just going to give you another one to think on for a second here. On September 13, 1993, over 3,000 dignitaries witnessed at the White House an event that most of them thought they would never see, an agreement signed between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization or the PLO. Israel made great concessions to get to this point. They agreed to trade land for peace. Israel's leader at the time, Itzhak Rabin, promised to include Palestinian autonomy or self-rule over Jericho and the Gaza Strip by the end of that year. Israel was also to recognize the PLO as the only legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. While Yasser Arafat said he would acknowledge Israel's right to exist, renouncing a por portion of the PLO charter, which calls for the annihilation of the nation of Israel. Concerning the final status of Jerusalem and the West Bank, area to begin not later than the third year after the agreement was signed, meaning the West Bank, meaning Judea. The whole world looked on in amazement as Itzhak Rabin, Bill Clinton, and Yasser Arafat appeared on the White House lawn and Arafat extended his hand to Prime Minister Rabin. This was history's most famous handshake and it sealed the first ever peace accord or supposed peace accord between Israel and her 3,000 year old enemy, the Palestinians, who are the Philistines. However, the entire Oslo peace process collapsed about seven years later over the issue of the Temple Mount area. In the agreement, what is known as the Al-Aqsa Mosque would be left under Arab control, which included unhindered access to it. But a problem developed when a clause that said the Jews would be allowed to pray on the Temple Mount was included. Israel's prime minister at the time, Ehud Barak, accepted the offer, but Yasser Arafat turned it down. So it seems that this Jerusalem issue will be the one that triggers the Battle of Armageddon. A Jewish peace plan has eluded world leaders for years and a call for international intervention into the Middle East has been building for many years. The time will soon come when a leader of the international community, the man who will later be revealed as the Antichrist, will confirm, confirm is not necessarily a good word here, confirm could mean enforce, coerce, strengthen a covenant, with Israel concerning their right to the land that they occupy. And our final question is this, who is he that confirms the covenant? And I think you probably already know who is he that confirms the covenant. Daniel 11, 21 through 45, which we're not gonna read, provides us with a lot of information about who is the one that confirms this covenant says this, I'm going to jump scriptures here. He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Verse 22 in that scripture calls him the prince that shall come. Verse 30 says he, he will have indignation against the holy covenant. Verse 31 says he will take away the daily sacrifice and place. He will become in its place the abomination of desolation. Verse 45 says, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. The he in Daniel 11 is the same he in Daniel 9.27. The he who confirms the covenant for seven years is the coming one world dictator, the Antichrist. Let's go back to the Temple Mount for a second. The Bible states that the nations of the world will fight against Jerusalem during the Battle of Armageddon. I'm not going to jump too far ahead, 
but this battle takes place in what's called the Val Valley of Megiddo, which is a real place in Israel. We're not going to talk too much about it because we're going to leave that for a future lesson. But obviously, Israel will be in control of Jerusalem from now until Armageddon, with one exception. The outer court of the temple will be controlled by the Gentiles. How do we know that? Because in Revelation 11, 1 and 2, it says this, and it was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar. And then that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, they shall tread underfoot 40 and two months. A Jewish temple will be completed by the time of this prophecy, because if there was no temple, John could not have been instructed to measure it. It could be that by prophesying, proposing the building of a new temple on the Temple Mount, the Antichrist could coerce the warring factions at that time into some kind of compromise. It doesn't really matter how it comes about, but scripture tells us that 42 months before Armageddon, or three and a half years, a temple will be standing in Jerusalem. In order for this temple to be standing at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, construction would have to begin at least a year earlier. Why? Rabbi Chaim Richman, who's a director of public affairs at the time for the Temple Institute of Jerusalem, says that a temple could be built in less than a year. You say, how would they possibly do that? It's because the Jews also understand prophecy and they have been preparing for such a time. They have been making plans to rebuild a third temple for a very long time. Gershon Solomon, who was the head of the Temple Mount Faithful, believes that God has called him to rebuild this Jewish temple. The Temple Institute, which is another organization dedicated to rebuilding the temple, says they have recreated over one half of all the vessels and instruments necessary for the reinstitution of Old Testament temple worship. They have the robes, the basins for catching the blood of the animals to be sacrificed, <clears throat> and the laver where the priests must wash according to Moses' instructions. Rabbi Getz, who is the late chief rabbi of the Western Wall, said that they know the location of the Ark of the Covenant, the candlesticks made by Moses, and the stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments. Take a step back for a second. <clears throat> when you see the beginning of the temple being rebuilt, you know that you are very close to the end of Daniel's last week in scripture. Some people also believe that the Dome of the Rock, which is Islam's third most holy site, was possibly erected upon the site that Solomon's temple once stood. One leading Jewish scholar believes that the original temple, so he has a contrary opinion, was not located on the present site of the Dome of the Rock. He believes it was actually further north, which is potentially a compromise between the Jews and the Arabs. But one thing is certain, there will be, because scripture tells us, a rebuilt third Jewish temple. What happens when this Jewish temple is rebuilt? Animal sacrifices resume. From an article in 2007 entitled Renew Animal Sacrifices on Mount, says Radical Rabbi. It states this, in the Torah, there are around 200 commandments dealing with animal sacrifices, says Rabbi Dov Stein of the Sanhedrin organization. The Torah of Israel demands animal sacrifices. What's going to happen when you see animal sacrifices? at a rebuilt temple. This, just think about the year 2023, this will be considered unbelievable cruelty and barbarism to the people of the world. 
Just I'll give you a for instance, in 1984, many of you not old enough to know this, it was a baboon heart that was transplanted into a little child called Baby Faye. Animal rights activists lost their minds during this. When people see this, there's going to be outrage over the slaughter of innocent animals in the name of Israel's religion. Very possibly, this could be one of the issues used by the Antichrist to usurp power or authority in Jerusalem. Why? To stop the senseless slaughter of innocent animals. Because why? what the scripture tell us in Daniel 9, 27? And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease or to stop. It is also against Jewish law for the Gentiles to enter the temple Judaism could be viewed as a religion of extreme exclusiveness and arrogance. It is very possible, like many other times during history, that the Jews in Israel will be viewed by the world as the one hindrance to world peace. Thus, the Antichrist will set himself up in the temple of God. And when this abomination of desolation occurs... The Great Tribulation begins, and the world has three and a half years left to be governed by this Antichrist. And so I'm going to go back just for one second. So I told you there was 70 weeks in Daniel's prophecy, and I also told you that 69 of them looked to already have been fulfilled, but the, seventh ha the 70th week has not been fulfilled yet. Why is that? Daniel did not see... And remember, Daniel also prays when he is given other when he is given other visions to understand what those visions or what those prophecies meant. And God tells him no. There is also something else Daniel did not see. Daniel did not see what we call the church age today. There has been about a two thousand year period of time since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And again, we do not know exactly what year Jesus's crucifixion actually was. Everybody will say 33 AD, but nobody can prove to you it was 33 AD. But a, been about a 2,000 year period of time that is known as the church age. Daniel did not see that period of time in the visions that he was giving, which is why we still have this final seven year period to be fulfilled that makes up Daniel's 70 weeks. But I'll ask everybody a question. What time is it? Speaking to NBC's Meet the Press in late April of 20, uh, 2009, King Abdullah of Jordan described the Israel-Israeli-Palestinian dispute as the core problem of the region and solving it would help the United States in dealing with Iran and combating the appeal of radical Islamic groups like Al-Qaeda. He went on to say that in the next 18 months, if we don't move the process forward and bring people to the negotiation table, there will be another conflict between Israel and another protagonist. October 2009, reported on Zinshuanet.com. It states that the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Mohammed El Baradai, said Israel is the number one threat to the Middle East. To the Middle East with its nuclear arms. Just so you're aware, a piece of side information, Israel has never said out loud that it has nuclear weapons. It is assumed that they have nuclear weapons to protect themselves against invaders in that area of the world. Ynet News, Abbas, forget temporary state, begin final status talks. While Special U.S. Mideast Envoy George Mitchell tours the region in hopes of jumpstarting the peace process, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas reiterated his objections to Israel's purported effort to establish a Palestinian state with temporary borders on 60% of the West Bank. Remember, the West Bank is Judea. The West Bank is a big problem about to happen. I hope the Israelis forget about the whole temporary state issue, he said Saturday during a meeting. So just so you're aware, again, historical People would debate this, what I'm about to say, but Israel was attacked in a number of different wars, and Israel, after they beat 
those nations that attacked them decided to keep those lands, no other nation in the world has beaten somebody and then has ever been asked to give them back the lands when they were the ones that were attacked. Good, bad, or indifferent, Israel has always been asked to give back those lands after they were the ones who defended themselves against somebody attacking them. They would not have given them those lands back. It's just a point of information. Let me go on, though. He goes on to say this. I call on the Israeli government to make a responsible decision and halt its settlement activities entirely in Jerusalem and the rest of the occupied territories so that we may begin substantial negotiations on a final status agreement according to a clear timetable. The talk should not exceed two years. He goes on to say, Abbas goes on to say, Abbas also called on Israel to invest in peace because it will yield political and security related results that are much more certain than the real estate investment and settlements that were confiscated from Palestinians. There is a problem though, a big problem for all those who come against and attempt to destroy God's holy city and God's holy people. I'm reading from Ezekiel 39, one through five. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Obviously, these were nations that existed at the time that these scriptures were given to pen. We're not going to talk about who these nations potentially are. There's many people who believe at least one of these nations is Russia, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. But let me go on, because that's not the important part tonight. And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. What does that mean? If you come against Israel, 83% of the armies and the people who come against Israel will be decimated and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Again, God knows that this is going to happen. He is orchestrating this happening. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. Let us pray we are not one of the countries that decides to come against Israel. Let us pray we are one of the countries that decides to be in Israel's support. The end times will be times of great conflict, horrible and evil deeds, but also great and righteous deeds. There's a book called The Tale of Two Cities, which many of you have heard of, written by Charles Dickens. It says it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. As all these things begin, begin to come to pass that we've talked about, great revival, will sweep through the true church of God. Exploits will be done in the name of Jesus Christ that have never been done before. I believe we are in the end time or the time of the end or the time of this, the end of this age now. The rapture of the church could happen at any moment. Knowing this, how should we be living our lives? Prophecies that have never been understood are becoming clearer. Imagine what fervor or anger will sweep the world, just depends what side you're on, when the Jews begin to build a third temple in Jerusalem. Why am I saying that? Because it's time for us to awake out of any sleep that we might find ourselves in. If the church can comprehend prophetic scriptures the effect will be dramatic. We cannot let Satan lull us to sleep in these last days. We must be aware of the times in which we're living. 
and we must be aware of what's happening all around us. Thank you everyone tonight. Next week's lesson, the four horsemen of revelation.